been good to us. You have been good to us. And for that, Lord, we say thank you. Lord, we glorify you. Lord, we lift you. We magnify your name, Lord. God, we praise you for who you are, for what you have already done. God, we thank you for what you're going to do. God, we praise you, Father God, for what you're doing right now. God, we thank you again, Lord.
while you're still standing, I want to look at uh, Genesis chapter 22 one more time. Hallelujah to the Lamb. Genesis chapter 22. We look at one verse, verse number 13. Genesis 22 and 13. Let me thank our live listening audience and our streaming audience for joining us here at the New Beginning Church, 4251 Sherman Road, Houston, Texas, 77048. Whatever you do, show this video and share this video that God will get the glory. Hallelujah Amen. to the Lamb. Genesis chapter 22, verse number 13. When you found it, you will discover these words. Then Abraham lifted his eyes and looked, and there behind him was a ram caught in the thickets by his horns. So Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up for a burnt offering instead of his son. All right. I want to talk about God provides All right. the sacrifice. Yes, sir. Amen. Amen. God provides a sacrifice, a the sacrifice. We serve the amazing God. Yes, sir. As I look back over my childhood life, I wasn't really good of a boy. Life for me was up and down, and every time. Even though I was reared right, every time I went places, I didn't do what was right. All right, all right. Yeah. It is confession time. It's, right. it's some 40, 50 years later now. I can, <laughs> I can finally tell it since daddy has gone on to be with the Lord. I can, I can finally admit to it and own up to it. Many times, I, I did do all that I was taught to do. Yeah, <clears throat> I came up in church, I came up in Sunday school, but sometimes I misused my mind, my body, and sometimes I misused what mom and daddy had given me. Yeah. However, God always would allow somebody to come by and become the sacrifice for my foolishness. Oftentimes, oftentimes, the police officer that lived next door to us uh, Officer Eugene, Eugene Collier oftentimes pulled me out of trouble. And after he pulled me out of trouble, he would joke about it in front of everybody. Many times, uh, Officer Eugene Collier lived next door. And his, he and my dad were, were schoolmates growing up. And so we moved next door to them. And when I was in Sunflower County and I got in trouble, I always called. Officer Eugene Carter. All right. We worked together at the Lewis Grocery Company, and we worked there together at night. And at day, in the daytime, uh, we saw each other in passing. And then he worked a night shift for the police department at Inverness, Mississippi. Y'all know where Inverness? Don't worry about it. You can find it on Google Maps now. He worked as a police officer there. And many times when I got in trouble and I really didn't want daddy and mama to know that I was in trouble, I would call Officer Eugene Collier and I would tell him, I would ask him to keep it to himself. But he was so close to my daddy until he kept nothing to himself. While he was getting me out of trouble, he would be laughing about it. He couldn't wait to get home to tell daddy what I had gone through. One particular day, we, I, I took mama's brand new car. It was, I took mama's car. She allowed me to go to Hollandale, Mississippi, and I, I was living in Houston by now, and I had cleared my name back home, and I wasn't getting in any trouble back home at all. I had decided to walk with the Lord and stay with him while I was here because I realized that I didn't have Officer Collier to call on anymore. Right mm -hmm. I went home and I, 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 was, I was glad that I was able to stay out of trouble, but then I went home and borrowed Mama's car on my way from Indianola to uh, Hollandale, Mississippi to see a friend of mine that we graduated from college together 
I got around in a curve and got in some loose gravel in Mama's new car. And if you're from the country, you know there's no steering in loose gravel. There's no control for you in loose gravel. And when I came out of the curve, I thought I was coming out of the curve, but the car just stayed in the curve. And I went across the cotton field, and I could see right before my eyes every cotton stalk in front of me coming up and disappearing, coming up and disappearing. Coming. And when I got out the car and I walked up and looked back from the street, the road, I saw nothing but Mama's tail lights to her car buried under the road, under the ground. The car was under the ground. The tail lights were sticking up. I knew I couldn't call Mama. I wasn't about to call Daddy. And uh, Officer Collier was in town that day, and he was working the night shift, so I called him. And even though it was outside of his jurisdiction, he would oftentimes sacrifice his job to come get me out of trouble. He would become the sacrifice for me. He would become the person that I would call on because I didn't want mama and daddy to know. But I already knew if he came and got me out of trouble, the cost I had to pay was he was going to laugh at me, he was going to make fun of me, and he was going to tell my daddy every step of the way. But I'm saying to you that growing up, every time I got in trouble, I had a sacrifice. He would sacrifice his job to come and get me out of trouble. He would sacrifice his sleep coming to get me out of trouble in the midnight hour. He would sacrifice being with his family to come and get me out of trouble. Look at how all y'all holy folk looking at me. Talking about what kind of trouble was he getting in. Same kind of trouble you getting in now. But he was my sacrifice. He was the one that would come get me out of trouble when nobody else would. Officer Cardi gone on to be with the Lord in the last sermon he heard me preach was my daddy's funeral and he was there and he said, boy, I almost shed a tear. He's still joking. He, he joked about everything. He, he would lock people up and be joking with them. He would laugh about everything, but he and most of the people in the neighborhood did not know that he was sacrificing his time, sacrificing his family, sacrificing himself, and sacrificing his job to pull me out. That's what the text is all about this morning. We run upon Abraham again, and Abraham had promised God that he would walk with God as God has promised Abraham. Abraham has been promised by God that wherever you go, I will go. Wherever you go and people bless you, I will bless those who bless you. Abraham, get up and leave your kindred, and when you get there, I will show you the place when you make up your mind to go. And he says, Abraham, those who bless you, I bless them. Those who curse you, I will curse them. And Abraham went everywhere, and folk blessed him, and God blessed the folk. Abraham and Sarah were old folk. Kind of like if Carolyn and I would have a baby now. Y'all would make fun of us because we're old folk. Because we are beyond the season days, we are old folk. It's, we have gotten to a point where we're very close to 60 now, and my birthday is coming up. And I, I am so glad I'll be able to say I'm 55. And you know, when we were back home, 55 plus was the age. And they had a council for the aging. And so we need to understand that we are appreciative of God for every moment that God gives us. And we must be appreciative to him for what he blesses us through. Some folk never want to tell their age. Well, if you're still 26 and you've been living 56 years, let me tell you something. You died years ago. It, I just, especially women, brother. Women get to the point where, where you know, a woman doesn't tear her age. And then they run around here lying to their children about being 26. And they were 26, 35 years ago. And now when their children get to be 26, they still saying they're 26. You better be glad that God has blessed you to make it over the hill one more time. So every day of my life, I'm not a big celebrator of birthdays, but every day of my life, I am thankful for God for a brand new day because his mercies are new every moment. 
Abraham and Sarah were old people. They have a baby. It's the baby of promise. It's, it's Isaac. It's the baby that God spoke to them about. They have a baby now, and then God tells Isaac, go take the baby. The boy that you've had, the boy that you've been waiting on, the boy that you've been praying with, the boy that I promised you that you would have, go and take that boy Isaac up on Mount Moriah. And when you get there, I want you to sacrifice him. Now, when I talk about sacrifice, sacrifice is not a pretty word. We sacrifice some things for our children, but we don't want to sacrifice our children. But Abraham follows God's beckoning calling. He walks upon Mount Moriah, and he's just at the point where he's about to take Isaac's life. He raises his hand with the knife in his hand, and he's about to take his life. And the angel says, hold up. Stop. Don't do it. He says, stop. Wait a minute. Now, Isaac, I told you on last week, he saw the wood. He saw the fire. He knew his daddy was going to make an altar. And so he asked the question, daddy, I see the fire. I see the wood. But where is the sacrifice? Abraham said that God will provide. Now, for most of us in this room, if not all of us, we would have had spread it a hundred God dash like never before. We would have put distance between our daddy and ourselves because you talking about God going to provide, you talking about God is going to deliver, you talking about God is going to be there, and you're going to take me up. And I'm the only thing that may be come to sacrifice. But Isaac got to the mountaintop. Abraham binds him up, lays him on the altar, the text doesn't say that he started screaming. He didn't say that he talked. The text doesn't say he talked back to his parents. You know, the problem with children in the 21st century, they have the luxury of talking back to their parents. If you were born in the 20th century, you wouldn't dare talk back to a parent. You, you wouldn't dare say anything. Matter of fact, you couldn't even say, mm, because that was just enough to send you to the dentist. That was just enough to send you to the doctor. You know, when we grew up in the 20th century, we couldn't even put wrinkles in our faces. Because they had a cure for every wrinkle. They had a cure for every grunt. Now I see folk with the same type of attitude, but they put it on the other children, but they can't put it on the 21st century, 21st century children. It's because we have grown out of discipline. We have legislated out discipline. And we don't hear mamas and daddies say words like this anymore. I brought you into this world. I will take you out of here. And they really meant it. We have testimonies all around the world where they really tried to do it. And they treated their children right. They loved their children, but they would not allow their children to be disrespectful to them. Not at home, not in public, not on the playground, not even in front of their friends. Now children are able to negotiate with their parents. Tell my mother, not in front of my friend. Daddy had a saying, and daddy would say it like this. Wherever you show out, that's where I'm going to show out. And when we went to the grocery store, a boy that didn't look like us would crawl on the floor and go up and down the aisle, crawling through the clothes and crawling and knocking grocery off the shelf. And their parents sit there and laugh about it. Daddy said, you try it if you want. If you get down there, I'm going to get down there with you. Parents who have their children under subjection. They're able to be a blessing to their children, and their children will be a blessing to them. If you spoil them now, they're going to be rotten later. Yeah. Right. Isaac didn't have a problem. He didn't have a problem raising up at his daddy. And, and we got children today that will tell you that, I'm going to put you out. I'm a man now. Don't have a pot to TT in, nor a window to put you out. He's going to put somebody out their own house. Isaac. Bound up by Abraham. He's bound up. He, he is tied up. And, and Abraham has told him that, that God will provide a sacrifice. And the boy believed him. The boy trusted him. That tells me that the boy had seen his daddy with a good track record. 
The boy had seen his daddy worshiping to God everywhere he went. And everywhere Abraham stopped, he built an altar unto God. It reminds us that as parents, our children need to see us honoring God more than they see us making money. They need to see us honoring God more than they see us going to work. They need to see us honoring God and praising and blessing his name more than he see us hanging out on the cliff. So Abraham binds up his own boy. He didn't bind, he didn't bind up the boy by Haggai. He bound up the boy by Sarai. He bounds him up, lays him on the altar, and he's really getting ready to take him out. But there is in the thickets a sacrifice. There is in the thickets a ram caught in the thicket. The word sacrifice means something that will be altered up, offered up for your behalf. The sacrifice means that, that he will be one who will become the sacrifice for you. He will be one that will be offered up for you. And so the ram in the bush became the sacrifice and he took Isaac's place. He took his place. He took his place. Now Isaac's supposed to have been dead. Y'all know he's supposed to have been dead because his daddy was going to honor God regardless if the boy was still around or not. Father, in the text, God says, I'm going to continue to bless you, and, and you're going to have as much descendants as the, the stars in the heaven, and you're going to have as much descendants as the, the, the sands of, of grain on the beach, and I'm going to just keep blessing you. And he says to him, I'm going to bless you because of your obedience. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My question to you today, can God trust you? Can he trust you to be obedient to his word? Can he trust you just to do what he said he told you to do and do what you said that you would do? Or can they buy you out? Or can you be sold? Or will a little money get to you? Will you, will you really just commit yourself to the Lord, be obedient unto him, and trust God enough where God will deliver and you know he will deliver? You see, you don't, you don't stop. You don't stop. You, you don't stop trusting God because times get hard. I've seen, I've seen couples, not in this church, but in other churches. I've seen couples who love the Lord so much and they're just so excited. God has brought this man in my life and God has delivered me and blessed me with my prayer. Then when the joker started acting up, he said, are you sure you're the one that God wanted me to have? Yes, he is. And you ask her, when she start doing her thing, are you sure that we heard from God before we said I do? God does not stop blessing us or does not change direction with what he's blessed us with because times are hard. You know that Sister Davis is not living on a flower bed of ease living with me. You know that things can get rough around the house staying with me. You already said it because things sometimes can get rough at the church by staying with me. Well, but I thank God. I think I thank God. I, I hope I thank God that she never questioned whether I'm the man that God has given her. You know, I shouldn't be the man that God has given her when things are going well, when we're hanging out together, when we're smiling. I ought to be the same man that God has given her, even if we're having hard times together. Because that's what we promise, right? For better and for worse. For richer and for poorer. And God knows that she had to live up to the richer and the poor, because I was broken in Joe's brand new church. I was poor and couldn't spell poor. I was so broke, I couldn't make it. So it was for better and for worse, for richer and for poor, and sickness and in health. And I thank God it's because of sickness and in health, because I've been pinned down. I've been sick. I've been so sick to the doctor couldn't explain it. I've been so sick that life support had to be about me. And she stuck with me right there. And because we ought to live by what we commit to. We got to be obedient unto God. And when we're obedient unto him, he can bless us. So the ram became the sacrifice. Something has to be sacrificed. Something has to be delivered. Something 
has to be, uh, something has to be dealt with in a way that you don't want to deal with. If you're going to get your degree, you're going to have to sacrifice the party time. You're going to have to stop uh, shopping so much. If you're going to get your degree, you're going to have to spend some midnight oil staying up. Oh, young folk don't know what midnight oil is. You're going to have to keep the lights on at night and the computer running, and you can't be looking at other stuff. you got to look at what it is on the syllabus and carry out your time. You're going to have to sacrifice your brotherhood. You're going to have to sacrifice your sisterhood. You're going to have to sacrifice the things that you used to do if you're going to graduate. Now, if you're going to quit your weight, you might as well just do whatever you're going to do. Hang out with whoever you want to hang out with. If you're going to stop going, if you're going to give it up, if you're not going to work for the Lord, then you just keep doing what you're doing. Yeah, yeah. But if you're going to make it in this world, there has to be some sacrifices. Yeah. I thought when I got out of my mama's house, I didn't have to answer to no woman, no, no other woman. I said, when I get out of here, I'm going to do whatever I want to do, go wherever I want to do. Mm -hmm. Go wherever I want to go, hang out with who I want to hang out with, do whatever I want to do. But because God is in my life, I can't just do anything I want to do. And not to mention, I still got an answer to a woman now. Now I got an answer with four or five women at the same time. I got, I got Megan calling. I got, I got Macy wondering. I got, I got Carolyn telling me what to do. And then, Lord have mercy, I still got Rosa Davis telling me what to do, even though she's 600 miles away. And she does not apologize for it. I have to sacrifice myself in order for blessings to keep flowing. I have to also up some things. I have to make sure that I do the things that is, that is a blessing not only to me but to other folk. Young people, let me just say to you very candidly this morning, you must be willing to do today what others will not do in order to have tomorrow what others will not have. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You must be willing to do today what others will not do in order to have tomorrow what others will not have. Yeah, right. no, right. You must be willing to do it today. Yeah, right. You must be willing to do it today what others will not do. There will be others that will not sacrifice time. There will be others that will not sacrifice their pottery. There will be others that will not hold on to what they have. They will just spin it at will. But you have to be willing to do today what others won't do in order to have tomorrow what others won't have. Right. And then the haters will be walking around saying, she thinks she's something. You ought to remind them, I am. I'm a child of the king. I am because I'm a child of the king, and I've been obeying the king and not the stuff that you're doing. I have been obeying the king, and for that alone, God has blessed me. Yeah. Yeah. We need to understand it was on a mountain right. called Moriah mm -hmm. in Jerusalem that Abraham took Isaac up on a, a mountain in Jerusalem, Mount Moriah in Jerusalem, he was going to kill his son on a mountain in Jerusalem. Mount Moriah in Jerusalem. He was going to take his son's life for God's sake on a mountain in Jerusalem. Mount Moriah in Jerusalem. He was going to kill his son on a mountain. Yeah, yeah. But God sent a sacrifice. God sent a substitute. God sent something he can offer up other than his son. I stopped by on my way to the rapture to let you know I used to be bad and I, things weren't going so well for me and my sin was not started. I was so messed up. But God kept sending a sacrifice. And over 2,000 years ago, in Jerusalem, on a hill, on a mountain called Mount Calvary, he sent a sacrifice for me in the name of Jesus. In biblical days, in biblical days, there will always be time that they would have what is known as a scapegoat. Mm -hmm. You thought that when your boss, your boss set you up for failure, that was you being used as a scapegoat. That's right, because the scapegoat is when you put that which is wrong on somebody who has not been wrong in order for the person who really been wrong to escape the charges, to escape the sentences. Yeah, it was the scapegoat that they used in biblical days. They would have a goat, and the goat would come, and the goat would have, the priest would lay 
his hands on the goat. And there was a transmission going on spiritually because the people had sinned. The, the priest would lay his hand on the goat and the goat would take off running out through the thickets. He would take off running out through the fields. He would take off running in the woods and it became known as the scapegoat. The idea was that because the people had sinned and the priest had laid his hand on the head of the goat, the goat became the scapegoat for the charges that the people should have been charged with for the sin that the people had committed all over 2,000 years ago. Jesus the Christ became the ultimate sacrifice. He became the scapegoat for you and for me. We, our sins were messed up. He became our perpetuation. He gave us justification. He became the one who made a difference for us. And it was on a hill. On a mountain. In Jerusalem. Where Jesus gave his life for you and for me. We deserve to die. We weren't fit to live. We were too mean to die. But over 2,000 years ago, on a mountain in Jerusalem, on a hill in Jerusalem, Jesus died, I tell you. Jesus died for you, and he died for me. He became the scapegoat for us. We were wrong, and he was righteous. And because we were justified, he made us righteous. He viewed us as righteous because of the blood of Jesus. Oh, it was 2,000 years ago. They stretched him wide, and they lifted him I and drop him low. He became the scapegoat for us. He became the ultimate sacrifice. He voluntarily gave his life for you. And he gave his life for me. He died that day. These men murdered him. He, he died on the hill in Jerusalem. He died on the mountain in Jerusalem. He gave his life on a stone hill called Calvary in Jerusalem. They took him off the cross. Laid him in a foreign tomb. It was a foreign tomb because he wasn't going to stay there. All of that Thursday morning, he gave up his life. But all of that Thursday morning, he got up with all power. And heaven and earth in his hand. He's made a difference to me. He made a difference for me. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, it talks about we are walking in the midst of a tabernacle. And it says when this earthly tabernacle will be dissolved down here, we have another building, not made by hand, but eternal in the heavens. It goes further to say, now verses 13 and 14, along with 15, it says to us that one was given for once, one was given for all, and he was given one time for everybody. His name is Jesus. He died for you. He, he gave his life for you for every last one of us. There is no need for any other sacrifice because the ultimate sacrifice, Jesus of Christ has been given. The text declares that Isaac could have been dead, but God provides the sacrifice. And regardless of what you're going through, the sacrifice has already been given for you. Not for your new house, not for your new car, not for your job, but the sacrifice has been given for your spiritual walk in Jesus. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 declares that we have another building not made by hand, eternal in the heaven, and declares this building, this tabernacle as a tent. And one of these days we got to give up this tent. Matter of fact, we ought to want to give up the tent. Because every now and then this tent get holes in it. Every now and then the wind blows and the tent has to move around. Every now and then there's a leak in the tent. And you know the old folk used to cry out, there's a leak in this old building. And I'm going to move to another home. Paul declares to us that because Jesus has rescued us, we ought to live for him. We ought to live holy lives for him. We ought to live righteous lives for him. Because Jesus the Christ has paid it all over 2,000 years ago. While we were yet doing our sin, while we were yet dipping and dabbing, while we were yet running in the dark, he died for us. Paul declares that he gave up the ghost just for us. And because he has died for us, now I have been redeemed. Now I have been bought back and I've been brought back because the devil had me bound. 
You know, you can look at folk these days and you can tell when the devil got them bound. It doesn't matter how much you talk, doesn't matter how much you preach, doesn't matter how much Jesus you put in there, their mindset is still warped. Their mindset, you ought to forgive, sister, you ought to forgive, brother, and they can't, they can't let it go because they're not walking with him. You ought to stop fighting, brother. You ought to not stop fighting, you ought to stop fighting God. You ought to stop doing it the wrong way. But they can't do it because the devil has to has put their mind in prison. But Jesus died for our mind. Because he knows that if we can get the mind right, we can get the heart right, we will get right. He paid it all for us over 2,000 years ago. And today we celebrate his blood because it's his blood that covers us and makes us whole. Thank God for the blood of Jesus. And thank God that he has given us the great sacrifice in Jesus Christ himself. The door of the church is open. The invitation is extended. You are coming to Jesus. As you are. Don't wait till next week. Don't wait till the next sermon. Don't wait till tomorrow. You, you may not make it till tomorrow. You need to get it right right now. The door is open. The invitation is extended. This Jesus that we talked about, the ultimate sacrifice, he paid it all on the stuff he'll call Calvary. He did it for you. Though your sins may be as scarred, the blood of Jesus can wash you and make you whiter than snow. If you're here today or you're listening by way of cyberspace, you, you need Jesus. You need Jesus. You need Buddha can't do it. Confucius don't compare. You need Jesus. Muhammad can't make it. You need Jesus. The door is open. The invitation is you You want to come to Jesus. Just as you are. Will you come? Feel free to mail your offering to 4251 Shiro Road, Houston, Texas, 77048 USA. 4251 Shiro spell S C H U R M I E R, Shiro Road, Houston, Texas, 77048. 
0-4-8. Thank you so much for joining us and God bless you.